everyone. I'm Leslie, uh, occupational therapist at Harborview. I work on the outpatient department. Um, and Amy and I are really excited to present to you guys today about some of the things we've been learning as we've set up this lab and as we've been working with our advisory board. So as Debbie said, you know, we have people on our advisory board that work at um, some of the big companies housed here in Seattle. So from Amazon, Google, we have mixed reality. Um, we have a lot of different people from tech companies as well as people with spinal cord injury. So it's been a pretty exciting collaboration and we've been learning a lot and we wanna sort of um, share with you some highlights um, of the things that we've learned and some of the technology that we have in the lab. So um, just real quick, we don't have anything to d disclose. We have no financial interest or relationships with any of the companies or products that we talk about today. It's just simply our views. Um, and so our agenda, so we wanna talk about some trends in technology that can increase independence for people with spinal cord injury. So we're gonna talk about home automation and some of the products on the market right now and what to sort of keep your eye on for the future. And then we're gonna um, spend the second half with Amy talking about some of the specialized equipment that we have in the lab and some of the programs um, and share with you guys that. So we do have some learning objectives. We hope that by the end of the presentation, you'll be able to identify some household appliances that can be controlled with a virtual assistant. We hope that you can articulate some ways you could control a mobile device with power wheelchair controls. And then we also hope that you have an idea of how you might be able to do adaptive gaming hands-free. So this first uh, trend, home automation. I would be shocked if anyone in here has not heard the term smart home, uh, and that's for good reason. It's estimated that um, upwards of seven billion devices are currently in operation, smart home devices, and that is just rapidly increasing as well. So before we get started, I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about what a smart home is. And a smart home is really any residence that uses electronic devices, lighting, appliances, that can be controlled remotely by the owner, usually using a mobile device or a virtual assistant. So there is a lot of smart home technology on the market these days and pretty much all modern appliances and entertainment systems are being manufactured with smart technology in them already. Just simply meaning that they can connect to the internet and they can both communicate and share information and store information. So um, there are smart TVs, smart lights, uh, thermostats, your washer and dryer can talk to you, you can talk to it. Um, you can do a lot of things remotely and set them up on automation these days. So uh, before talking about specific items on the market right now, I wanted to talk about why we're talking about smart home technology at this forum and why we're really thinking about it for our assistive technology lab. And historically, as rehab professionals, we used to look towards things called environmental control units when somebody had a mobility impairment. And these were really specialized systems that could help people control lights, fans, um, things in the home, but they were very, very costly and they were sort of difficult and cumbersome to install. So when smart home technology first started coming on the market, we took notice and we we're like, wow, this is pretty exciting. It could open up a lot of doors. So, um, you know, smart home technology is, was initially targeted or marketed towards mainstream users and for convenience, security, um, energy efficiency, but very quickly I think it caught on that this is also uh, really increasing independence for people and safety in the home is one potential avenue. So now I would say it's a large area of marketing. Uh, one buzzword is elder care. We have a large aging population and a lot of people are interested in using this technology to keep people in the house longer. Um, and then another emerging area is moving into hospitals and healthcare. So there are new hospital facilities that have smart rooms where patients can control the hospital bed, you can call the nurse, control the lights, all hands-free. So uh, this technology is very mainstream at this point and it's really driving the cost down and it continues to propel the innovation forward. You have lots of smart devices in your house, let's say, and how are you gonna control them hands-free? So the primary way to do that is with a voice-controlled assistant. This is also sometimes called a virtual assistant or a smart speaker. 
And this is a standalone device where you would connect it to the smart devices in your home and be able to give it simple commands like turn on the lights or set the heat to 72 degrees. Hey Google, call mom. Uh, these first came on the market in about 2015 with the Amazon Echo. And in just that short amount of time, a lot of things have changed and, and it continues to evolve. So uh, one trend is um, these same virtual assistants have also a different platform. You can have them in a smart display. So you can now interact visually as well as with your voice. You can say, Alexa, uh, show me the temperature or show me the weather today. And um, you can video chat with them so you can interact more than with just your voice. Again, when these first came out on the market, we all, as rehab professionals, were like, wow, it would be so amazing if Alexa could make phone calls for you or you could text somebody hands-free. And in a very short time later, uh, that is uh, quite easy to do at this point. So we're, I'm gonna go through the different virtual assistants and how you could make a phone call with them. So with the Amazon Echo, you can call anyone in your contacts list or any number within the US, Canada, or Mexico um, just using your voice. And you can also do something new called the drop-in feature. And that is where you can drop in on another device in your home, another Echo, and it acts just like an intercom. So you just talk freely um, intercom style. And you can also drop in on an Echo in somebody else's house as well, as long as they've set up permission for that. So. I could just say, hey, Amy, <laughs> or drop in on Amy, <laughs> and we'll be intercoming, which is pretty cool. Um, you're not able to call 911 using this method, so, but you can if you have a second device called the Echo Connect and a landline, then you're able to call emergency services. So with the Google Assistant, you can also call anyone in your Google Contacts. This, they have a cool feature where it also has voice recognition. So if you have multiple users in the home and you say, hey, Google, call mom, it knows which mom to call. That's pretty cool. Uh, you're not able to call 911 with this device either. And that's because it's not actually using your cell phone to make the call. It's using Wi-Fi and internet in some way that I can't articulate. <laughs> <laughs> um, unlike the HomePod, so, so Apple launched its own virtual assistant in early 2018, and this device works when you make phone calls, it operates as a, a true speaker phone with your phone. So when you say, hey Siri, call mom, then it actually uses your phone to call your mom. So that opens up more doors. You can call 911 doing that because it's actually using your phone, and, and you can actually answer the phone as well. So if somebody is calling on your cell phone, you can ask Siri to answer it, and it it will answer it on the home pod. This is an interesting product too. So it's actually been around a couple of years, the Facebook portal, and this is the first hardware that Facebook has come out with. It hasn't done amazingly well, but it has some pretty cool features. There's a smart camera built in that will follow you around the room. So when you're video chatting with people, the camera will follow you and zoom in and out according to what it thinks it should be showing. Um, so you can, face, you, can, um, you can video chat anyone else that has Messenger. And then it also has Alexa built in, so it can also be your virtual assistant to control your lights and your TV and all those things. It can be one device in your house. They're also talking about in the future adding Google Assistant so that you could choose your favorite virtual assistant. So what if you can't use your voice? So these devices are very voice forward. And for a lot of people, voice is, is not uh, a good way to control the devices. So you might not speak English or uh, you might have a heavy accent. Some people are on ventilators. Voice is not the right input for everybody. So there's some new technology coming out for gesture control. So if anyone is familiar with the Microsoft Connect, that's an early version of gesture control device. So the camera would interpret your body movements and you could control things that way. And it looks like a lot of the virtual assistant platforms are gonna move towards having gesture control as another forms of interacting. So that's pretty cool. Facial recognition is another control method that doesn't require voice. So if anyone has used uh, Apple's Face ID to unlock your new phone, then you could imagine how this technology might be used for um, other things like smart locks, so you could walk up to your door, it will 
recognize your face and unlock the door for you. And there are products that do that already on the market. So over there on the right is one example of facial recognition door lock. Um, so yeah, let's talk about opening a door with some of this smart technology. You can, probably everyone has heard of, um, uh, oh, what are these called? <laughs> Doorbells with, with security cameras. Um, and so you can see who's at the front door, you can talk to them intercom style, and then you can also use a smart lock to decide whether or not to unlock the door for them, or you can send people visiting your house a key virtually. So pretty easy to lock and unlock hands-free. And then if you want to actually open the door, you could pair um, an automatic door opener, something like the Open Sesame, with a smart garage door opener and then also a smart speaker. So this way you could ask your virtual assistant to open the door for you. And we're gonna watch a video of uh, Tyler Schrank doing just this. So Tyler Schrank is one of our advisory board members and um, he has also made quite a few educational videos and one of them is opening the door. So let's see it in action. In this video, I'm going to show you how I can open and close my door using an Amazon Echo, an Open Sesame door opener, and a GoGo Gate garage door opener. Alexa, trigger door open. Sending them to it. Alexa, trigger closed door. Sending them to it. This is Tyler, and this is how I get in and out of my house independently. Okay, so uh, there's some things worth considering and things that we, uh, you know, will help people consider when they come to, the, to our lab. And one of those things is security and data privacy. This is a very hot topic of conversation. And for us in the lab, I think what it will really boil down to is, you know, how, how much do people trust the manufacturer of their virtual assistant? And how much do they trust the, smart, the manufacturer of the smart device that they're controlling? Um, and, you know, what sort of people will be in and out of your environment. So, I hate to say it, but I think that we could all get into Tyler's house now <laughs> by just asking Alexa to open the door. So, uh, there's not a lot of authentication of, of who's the user and, um, you know, making sure that things are secure. So, another important thing to consider is reliability. So if we're using smart home technology as an assistive technology and people are relying on this for independence and safety, what's the backup plan? What if the Wi-Fi goes down? So we wanna really think that through. And then compatibility of devices. Not all devices work well together. Um, and then there can be cross interference. We're really running into this in the lab because we have a small space and a lot of products that we wanna try out. So when I say, hey Siri, I wake up like three iPads in my smartphone. Um, so there's some navigation to be had there. And then uh, really we want to match the right technology with the user for their goals and, um, and needs. So you know, we'll be thinking about voice and language skills, the complexity of the equipment, the cost of updating and maintaining it. So we'll, we'll help people think those things through. So I just have a few more slides before I hand it over to Amy to talk about assistive technology, but I wanted to look at some things that are sort of emerging and new and things to keep your eye on. So uh, voice assistance in your car, this is already happening in higher end newer vehicles, but BMW just announced they're gonna be adding in some gesture control. So you could be driving along and point to a building and say, you know, hey, what's that building? It will tell you. It's crazy. <laughs> um, 
There are a group of researchers at UW who have made a voice-controlled robot. They've paired it with Alexa. So you can say, hey Ale Alexa, have the robot feed me a strawberry. And there are smart cameras and sensors in that robot that will look around, find the strawberry, find your face, and feed you. <laughs> this is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, and if you want to check out a cool robotic arm, Canova is here today, and they have a robotic arm out, out in the lobby. So definitely check that out. Um, and then lastly, so virtual and augmented reality. This is a really exciting area of technology, and it's also becoming more and more mainstream. And as it does so, you know, it's important to be thinking about how people with uh, limited mobility or any disability are able to access virtual reality. So uh, we're really lucky to have Jeff Rayner here today from Mixed Reality. He is also one of our advisory board members. And uh, after joining the board and meeting some of the people with spinal cord injury, he set out to solve some of the barriers. So uh, he's been working with Jesse Collins and Tyler Schrank, and they meet regularly. And they've been exploring what does it mean to experience virtual reality from a power wheelchair and with sip and puff control. So they have started to identify some of the barriers, like if you don't have full head and neck control, you can't fully access all of the platforms. So um, their work is really exciting. You should definitely stop by their booth today. He can articulate it much better than I can. Um, but a few things that he, uh, Jeff has told me about as well is, you know, they're finding it really helpful to think about education for people. So when you're first injured and you're in a power wheelchair, um, getting time to practice driving with sip and puff. So what if you could do that in a virtual r world? It can be more motivating and more practice. Um, maybe it might feel a little safer. So there's lots of possibilities there. He also told me about something called an empathy emulator. And I thought this was really cool. And that would be where an able-bodied person could have a virtual reality experience of being in a wheelchair. So this can open up a lot of doors for other people to start to understand what are the barriers and what could be the solutions um, and just relate a little better. So definitely stop by their booth today. I'm going to hand it over to Amy. Okay. <laughs> um, so as Leslie mentioned, my name is Amy Noonan. I'm an occupational therapist on the inpatient rehab unit at Harborview. Like tech, uh, Leslie said, technology is ever growing, ever expanding in the consumer world, but also with assistive technology. So I'm going to talk a little bit about computer, phone, and tablet access. So computer access has actually been around for decades, you can see in these photos. Traditionally, it's been expensive. It requires having a specific product with limited capabilities. When it breaks, no one knows how to fix it or maintain it. Um, or we lean to more of a lower tech option, like the mouse stick on the right there. But really, with all of these technological advances, if we're able to use higher tech um, equipment that's actually less expensive. So one of that, or one of those, is Windows Eye Control. So eye gaze technology has been around for more than 10 years, um, but Windows has now included it in Windows 10. So that means if you currently have a computer or a tablet that runs Windows 10, you already have access to this technology. Um, you can find it in your ease of access settings. You do need an add-on eye tracking um, device. It's compatible with a couple different options, but they recommend this Toby Eye Tracker 4C, which is only about $150. Um, while that is expensive, compared to traditional eye gaze technology, it's way cheaper. So with your eye tracker and your computer, you can now access the on-screen mouse, keyboard, and text-to-speech program using only your eyes. New features included on this is the precision mouse, um, some people have complained with eye gaze technology has been it's hard to get directly over a target. So this allows you to get in the near vicinity, use smaller refined controls to get exactly where you want, and then it offers a left, right, or double click option. Another big complaint with eye gaze technology is the length of time it takes to type something. 
So you ha it requires dwelling and it takes forever and it's frustrating. Um, so Windows has come out with shape writing, which allows you to dwell on the first letter. You glance between the other letters and then dwell on the last letter and it predicts what, you, what it thinks you might want to say and gives you options that are, um, if that's not correct. Also, another great option for communication is using that shape writing in their built-in app. Um, so you can pull up a keyboard, type what you want to say, and the computer will then say it out loud for you, which can be super helpful for people that aren't able to communicate. Um, so an awesome pr uh, project came out of this. Michelle Swinka, who is in the back there, um, has been super vital, and she was able to connect us with the Enable team who's uh, developing this software. Uh, Leslie and I were able to go to their lab and just talk with them. So their project up until then had been really focused on people with ALS who just have some different goals for access. So we're able to educate them on um, spinal cord injury and what goals for access we might have. Um, and they were so interested and engaged in learning more about how to make people more efficient with this. We then hosted their team at Harborview for a demo night. Um, and so we had practitioners, we had people with spinal cord injury actually come and try the equipment. Um, and, be, and we were able to ask all our questions, what about this, and give them feedback on this is what we want out of your equipment, um, which was really well received by that team. They actually donated a full setup for us for eye tracking and plan to donate two additional setups to us as well. So then we took that donated equipment um, and our resident Selena Smith, uh, the lead speech therapist on our team, she has now begun trialing that in trauma ICUs. So the first few days of hospitalization can really be scary, right? You're not able to communicate with your loved ones. You're not able to ask your questions um, to the doctors, to your nurses. So using this device for communication can really make a huge difference. She's only been able to try it with a couple patients, but so far it's had um, been very successful. Um, so if eye gaze isn't your thing, um, head control is another option for someone with um, pretty good head movement. So again, traditional devices have been really expensive. This will cost you $1,000 and requires that you have a sticker somewhere on your face or your head. Um, so someone to help you set it up. There's now free software app out there, um, the Camera Mouse eVia Cam or the Head Mouse 4.3 um, is free to download. It is PC specific, so you can't use it on your Mac computer. Um, but you download it, turn it on. You can see this lovely picture of myself <laughs> um, where it finds, identifies facial features, whether it's an eyebrow, your nose, your lips, and uses that for mouse tracking. It does utilize dwell for clicking, um, which can be less efficient. Um, while I found this to be a little bit less accurate and it really depended on the lighting in the room, I was trying with a window behind me um, and that it just was terrible. It's free uh, and it can be really useful. Um, as far as head mouses, the, I'm gonna mess this up, Qha Zono is um, a wireless gyroscopic head mouse that's available now. You can wear it as a headband, um, on a hat, or on glasses, or even they have a neck band too. Uh, and the way this works is it connects wirelessly through a USB plug that you plug into your computer. Um, and then you can add on an accessory switch. So whether it's a contactless puff switch, you can do sip and puff, or an accessory switch um, wherever you prefer placement, whether it's your head, a shoulder, an elbow, what have you. Um, it does cost about $1,000, so on the more expensive end. Um, something cool that I haven't actually gotten to try yet, but I'm going to show you a video, is this hands-free docking station um, for independent donning and doffing. Kuha Zono wireless head mouse is motion controlled, precise, and intuitive, and makes it possible to use a computer in a flexible way. 
and now it's a lot easier to use. The Kuha Nemo, a hands-free charging and docking station, makes using the Kuha Zono more accessible than ever. The same precision and flexibility to access your computer and a hands-free charging and docking station. The Kuha Zono and the Kuha Nemo working together to increase independence. So again, I haven't tried it, but it looks pretty darn cool. Um, also out there in the gyroscopic mouse world is the new glass owls. Um, so this is worn as a pair of glasses and it's Bluetooth connection, so you can connect it to any Bluetooth enabled device that allows mouse emulation. Um, it too, you can add accessory switches. They have this cool bite switch. Um, they have a standard puff switch, or again, any switch where you want to place it. Um, and actually, if you're interested, we have one sitting at our booth over here if you want to take a look. The nice thing about the glass house, it's less versatile for wear, but it costs about half the price as the Kua Zono. Um, now let's talk about mouth-operated joysticks. Um, so the lip sync is out there now. We have it over, it's red on the table as well. Um, and it's created by Makers Making Change. This is actually a 3D printed device. Um, and it's, so it's a mouth-operated joystick and you use your sip and puff for your left and right click. Um, it costs about $300 to order from their website or if you have the skills, which I don't yet, hopefully someday, um, and have a 3D printer, some soldering tools, you can actually make your own. Um, I don't know what the cost difference of the materials, but I suspect it's pretty cheap compared to buying it outright. Um, while we love this and we love the cost, we have heard of some durability issues with it. Um, so we still always love our Quad Joy as it remains a leader in kind of being a mid-range cost, as well as pretty durable. The great thing about these devices is now they're not only for your computer. Um, so phones and tablets are now accepting mouse emulation for use. Um, unfortunately, Apple devices are not yet um, or allowed to use uh, mouse emulation. So it's gotta be Android, Amazon tablets. But really, it's as simple as taking your favorite mouse, say the Quad Joy, um, and having the right USB adapter. So in this photo, I have it set up. This is an Android tablet. I just have a USB-C to USB receiver. I plug my Quad Joy in, and I can use my mouse on the tablet just like I would a computer. Um, so it can really, it, switch control I think has its benefits, but there's always barriers with certain websites and access, so mouse emulation can really speed things up. Um, so now let's talk about access through your power wheelchair. Um, power wheelchairs are now coming with built-in technology um, to be able to access your smart devices, your computers, your phones, your tablets. There's a couple potential routes for access. Uh, one is the use of infrared, um, and then otherwise Bluetooth. So whether you're using the built-in Bluetooth on your wheelchair or an external device like the Tecla E. Um, so uh, infrared is the first option, and this connects two devices just like your TV remote. So anything that has that infrared signal, you can uh, program your wheelchair to use your drive controls to run it. Um, it's as simple as programming. Um, you're setting up, you're pushing one switch on your TV remote and assigning it to a switch on your drive control. Um, the one downside of infrared is like a TV remote, you have to be within line of sight for that to work. Bluetooth allows you to be just in the vicinity and it actually was first integrated by Quantum in 2005, which I didn't really realize, I thought it was a more recent, but um, it's really come a long way. So now, Bluetooth is built into most power wheelchairs, um, and depending on the brand is gonna be the quality. So some, some brands are a little bit more uh, further along with their development, and or can link to more, more devices than others. 
but this allows you to Bluetooth link to your phone um, and then you can assign your drive controls to run your phone. So you don't ever need an additional switch or device. Um, while this is awesome and comes built in on the Bluetooth, it's not without its flaws. Um, we've had some connectivity issues. It can be pretty frustrating if the Bluetooth drops and you need someone to help you relink the Bluetooth. Um, and then there's also been complaints about lag time, so that it's not as responsive as to your controls. So Q, the new Tecla E. Um, many of you may know of the Tecla Shield, which is the first version, where you could use alternative controls and link to a single device through Bluetooth. The new Tecla E connects to, I think, up to eight devices. Um, and can really work in two ways. So you can use it directly on your power wheelchair. So if you're gonna do this, note that you need an extra box, um, depending on your wheelchair, an IO, um, input output module box or an ECU box to plug the Tecla in. But then you can program your power wheelchair drive controls to your smart device. So again, it's just offering um, improved connectivity, less drop signals, and reduced lag time for your controls. You can also use it kind of in addition to your power wheelchair controls if you want a separate set of controls. Um, so this would be you could have it mounted, but you're not actually hardwiring through your power wheelchair, but you're using additional switches or sip and puff um, or your preferred controls through directly to your device, so you can actually text and drive, which I don't recommend. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna completely switch gears on you guys and talk a little bit about adapt adaptive gaming. So, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Super Bowl commercial, it was super cute, but the new um, adaptive Xbox adaptive controller is out, um, and it's pretty awesome. So. It allows you to plug in any switch to correspond with um, the standard buttons on an Xbox controller. You can also use what's called Copilot. Um, so this is using two different controllers for one player. So maybe you wanna play with a friend and Leslie's gonna do gas and brake and I'm gonna do left and right. Um, alternatively, if you wanna use some parts of a standard controller and some parts of the adaptive controller. You could set up to use a different sort of joystick, but the same switches on the standard controller without any kind of interference. Um, the other thing too is you can actually reconfigure a standard or the adaptive controller. So for someone who has a great fine motor strength on one side, we can actually reconfigure the controller so we can take all of the important buttons on a game and put them on the left side of the controller so you could play one-handed. Um, so for gaming setup, so you can kind of see in the top uh, right is uh, that white box is the adaptive controller. On the back of it has a line of 3.5 millimeter plugs. So you can plug any of your favorite switches into there and then mount them however you like. It then has two USB ports on either side corresponding to the left and right um, joysticks of a standard controller. So you can plug whatever kind of joystick in that you want. Um, this has been an amazing product. As a therapist, um, I found people are way more motivated to race race cars than like play with blocks with me. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, and I think of one patient in particular who was really having a hard time. He really didn't want to get out of bed, um, really wasn't participating in therapy, and it was right about the time that uh, we got this equipment. He was the, actually the first patient I tried it with, and man, I mean, when I said, hey, we're gonna work on the Xbox today, he was up out of bed, motivated, sweating, because he was working so hard, it was great. Um, and just to note, the, the Xbox accessibility team is here today, so be sure to check it out. I bet they'll explain it way better than I just did. Um, again, Michelle Baswinka was an amazing resource for us, um, and she actually linked us with the Xbox team. 
and we were able to host several adaptive game nights at Harborview. Um, so this has been uh, any of our current inpatients on rehab as well as outpatients can come together and game and try various setups for the Xbox. Um, and it's offered us a time so many of the, access to the Microsoft team have attended and we've been able to ask questions, um, come up with solutions, as well as give them feedback on this is what we want out of it. Um, so it's been a really great collaboration. Um, and it even expanded one of the game developers for Forza, which is the car game we love, um, has come and been able to give us solutions on how to navigate um, their game and kind of best ways to use it, as well as taking feedback back to his team. It's, their menu can be really frustrating to be able to navigate, and so he's taking that back for future iterations of the game. Okay, and just to wrap up here, um, we couldn't have done this without all of our team. So uh, really without the Craig Nielsen Foundation grant, um, we wouldn't have made, been able to do all of this. And really, I think we, I speak for Leslie too, this was a dream that we had and we've always seen this equipment and stared at it with googly eyes and now <laughs> we actually have it and are being able to introduce people to it, which has been amazing. And then, of course, our Harborview team, Dr. Debbie Crane um, has been our fearless leader along the way. Um, Dr. Esselman has been so supportive and actually provide us a, an awesome space that's really local, close to rehab and close to outpatient at Harborview. Selena Smith has been our lead speech therapist. And then, of course, our fearless manager, Kristen Kalbring, who's been supportive and guidance, guiding us along the way. And then our super passionate advisory board. I'm not gonna list everybody, um, but you can see everybody's name up here and make sure to say thank you if you see them along the way. They've had such passion and enthusiasm. It's been totally infectious um, and we've really appreciated all of their guidance and uh, consultation along the way.